So you decided you were moving to Barcelona, but now you're asking yourself, what do I do next? Hey there, my name is Ashley and I have navigated moves abroad to Chile and Barcelona. In this video, I'm going to help you navigate your move abroad process. And I'm going to be showing a corresponding page from my navigate your move abroad guide and checklist. You're going to see a few pages that I referenced throughout the video, but this guide and checklist is over 30 pages long and can be used for any moving abroad process, not just to move to Barcelona. A little special shout out to my friend Veronica who looked over the guide for me and has also navigated a few of her own moves abroad. So if you're not sure where to start and the process just seems overwhelming because it can be, this guide was designed with you and mind. It is the combination of my trials and errors, things that I did good, the mistakes, the things that I learned along the way that other guides or videos that I watched didn't really talk about necessarily. Let's start with the cost of living. And as I just discuss the cost of living here. I'm going to be comparing it to where I'm from, New York City. Rent is very expensive here. You can pay, and I'm talking about like friends that I know and like my family members, who pay $1,100 per person. So that means like their space is like $2,200 and it's like very small and it kind of just goes up from there. There could be some areas that are a little bit cheaper depending on the neighborhood, how in the center you are, how a little bit further away from the center you are. What neighborhood you're in really depends how much you're going to pay. I paid $480 and that also included utilities. Now I lived in a very nice apartment, but I had a very small bedroom, but I also had a really great location. Every type of transportation is easily accessible to me. The tram, the train, the bus station, if I wanted to go to like another city in Spain or even like France. So I was pretty central. In terms of transportation, I paid about 40 euros a month for like this unlimited card. And with this, you had access to different types of transportation. You could use it for the bus, you could use it for the metro, you could use it for the tram, and it even included airport transport. So you can take the train all the way to the airport. New New York, for example, an unlimited Metro card is about like a hundred dollars, 110 maybe. In terms of phone, for like a prepaid plan, I paid about 15 euros. I made the mistake of putting like a lot of money when I first got there. I paid about 30 euros the first two months until the classmate was like, you don't need 30, you can do 15. And that was lovely because I did save myself about 15 euros a month if I didn't know that. And that 15 euros was enough for the entire month. I never ran out of data. And I used Vodafone. What was cool about it is that like when you did travel like within like the European Union, you were able to use your phone. Groceries are about a hundred euros a month. Every week I went to the grocery store and I bought like what I needed and sometimes a little bit more than that compared to the US where it could be like about $200. So that was definitely like a difference in that. And miscellaneous, which I would include like trips, I was traveling, going out to dinner, buying something, could be between like 100 to 200 and upwards. What I actually like to do in preparing, one, I like to write down everything that I need to do in terms of finance. I like to kind of create two budgets when I'm preparing my finances. One of these budgets is like the current budget that I'm working with, which includes visa expenses that I'm paying like while I'm still in my home country, in this case, New York. And then I like to make projected living abroad expenses. And this is where I would use like the cost of living that I just mentioned that I'm researching and I would put it into this budget. I would put in like rent, phone plan, groceries, just to see what it would be like to live there for a month. And I like to use this budget that I create for myself to see how much I need to save, if I'm saving, what are like the startup costs when I get to the country, even if I am working, I might not be getting paid within like the first month or so. So what do I need to have saved so I'm able to cover the cost of living? Housing. A few things that I definitely recommend when it comes to housing that you can do even before you arrive to Barcelona. I recommend kind of really thinking about like what is it that you're looking for in terms of a living space in a neighborhood as well and list out your criteria. I personally really wanted to be really central and so I ended up living less than a 10 minute walk from Arc de Triomphe which is kind of like in the Le Chample area about a 20 minute walk from the beach and I really liked that area. Another thing to consider is like transportation. Are you working or are you studying? What do you want your commute to look like? If you have to you know travel to go to, to work, to teach, or whatever the case may be for an internship or universities in the outskirts of Barcelona, what do you want your commute to look like? Do you want to be like really close to the main train that you have to take? Do you mind, you know, taking multiple trains to get there? Another thing to consider is like I had mentioned in one of my videos, interior, exterior, the way the buildings are made in Barcelona. Some bedrooms are exterior, meaning outward facing. So you have a view of the street and you get direct sunlight. If you have an interior facing room, 
that means you don't have direct sunlight you're facing an interior of the building so those are some things to consider like when you are thinking about where do you want to live and those are all things you can do even prior to actually getting to barcelona you have an idea of what you're looking for and what the vibe is and it can completely change but it's a good thing to kind of have an idea in mind before actually getting there it takes away a little bit of that overwhelming feeling of like i need to figure out a place to live where to find housing so some of the sites apps that i personally use that i liked a lot were Edilisa and Badi. Badi is actually the app that i found my apartment in barcelona you can filter what you're looking for other things of course you can always check out facebook groups all right i got my documents here this is going to be a long one it's bureaucracy it's always going to be complicated and at times overwhelming and i'm gonna try to do my best to break it down visas are very time sensitive i really recommend the first thing to do any like moving abroad situation is reach out to your local consulate your local embassy and ask for the visa requirements because things change so i always just say local embassy local consulate email them even if they like go to this page and link that's fine just ask what the requirements are i have my original <laughs> document here of what i needed for the what was the student visa and it breaks it all down and you can still see like my highlights <laughs> In the guide, I will have you list out the documents you need, the time frame, and the cost of the doc documents. Some of them, I will say, are like pretty standard. But for example, some things that you need, let's just really quickly go through it. So you need your application form, of course. You need um, your original passport, passport size photograph. That's pretty standard. A letter of acceptance as a full-time student or university or like internship. Again, it has the specifics. Proof of health insurance. There's also a part in the guide that you can research the types of health insurance you want and proof of financial means during your stay. And then has like different options of what that could be. Of course, the money order to pay for that. And then other things you're going to need are like your copy of a police record. So basically this is you have to get an FBI background check and then you have to get that document, a apostille, a post I never want to say apostille, which is basically like a certification saying that this document is real and then a medical certificate from your doctor saying that you're in good health you have like no infectious diseases all of those things you can list it out on this page the time frame from when you need it because some of them are time sensitive like for example the medical certificate has to be issued within 90 days the police report has to be no more than six months again time sensitive so you want to make sure that you're getting everything within the time frame that is listed on this piece of paper within like a month or so you will get your passport with your visa that doesn't mean you're free <laughs> when you move to spain you have your passport you have your visa you go to barcelona or anywhere else in spain but specifically in barcelona in this case that visa in your passport technically is only valid for like three months it's like you have the visa but like you don't because you have to do like one other step in order to make sure that you're good and that you're able to study or work or whatever it is that you're doing in the country which is you have to get your tia and your tia is basically like your id card in order to do the this and get your tia you have to go through another bureaucracy process on page 33 of the guide there is a first month in to do slash checklist of things that you have to get done within like the first month or so and this is where this will go so for the documents for your tia you're going to need a empadronamiento i've talked about this in another video we'll go back to that you're going to need the ex17 form proof of pavement you have to go to a bank you have to show your acceptance letter, a passport photo, passport, and then always have a copy of the visa slash passport page. And so that's kind of like the standard of what they're going to ask you for. I don't think they asked me for everything when I went. A good rule of thumb when it comes to bureaucracy systems, always bring everything they ask you and then some. And what I mean by that is I took every document that they asked for. And then I took the documents that I also had from my visa application. Some of them were similar, some of them were different. I had everything because you never know. And I didn't want to go back and make another appointment because those are really difficult to come by when it comes to making an appointment. So I always bring everything and then some. Going back to the empadronamiento. What this is, is basically just proof of residence. So you can either get it in person, online, or by mail. I highly recommend just going in person. Some of the items that you're going to need. You're going to need to bring in your ID, which in this case would be your passport. Proof that you live there. So there is this form, autorización de inscripción en el padrón municipal, which basically the person who has a contract in your apartment, so in this case was my roommate, she would fill this out for me with a copy of my roommate's id and i had to bring in the actual contract or like the lease that states the lease is in her name in order to get this document that you need to get your tia so again it's like a process within a process to get this id so once you get all that you have your appointment you go in and you should be getting this document 
within the same day. Appointments for the Thea, I recommend doing it at like really early in the morning, like at 8 a.m. because that's when they usually release appointments and make sure that you're doing this process within the first three months because after three months, the visa that you have technically expires. You have to do this in order to be able to kind of stay in Barcelona for the entire you know year that you're there for to study or to teach or whatever it is that you're doing. The next section is weather and packing. So you can find the packing list on page 23. I tried to make it as extensive as possible. So the weather in Barcelona is very Mediterranean. Uh, it's pretty humid. It's pretty hot. It doesn't get very cold. The coldest it will ever get really. I think it's like 40 maybe if that. I say that because depending on where you're coming from, again if you experience a winter that is very cold with a lot of snow, the winter in Barcelona might not be something that you find to be extreme or to be cold. So packing snow boots or your really big winter jacket that you would use in a city like New York or maybe somewhere else is not something that's going to be very useful for you in Barcelona unless of course maybe you're traveling or skiing or something to these really cold climates so you're going to need that but won't take up a lot of space because winter clothes can be very bulky and if you're planning to just go maybe for like a semester abroad a year even if it's like two years and you don't want to take you know your whole entire life quite yet you don't really want to overpack things that you don't need and underpack the things that you do need. So researching the weather, comparing that to the weather that you're used to, is really beneficial when it comes to packing. For the different seasons, how can I take an item of clothing and use it? For example, a dress. I have a dress that I can wear in the summer when it's like hot and humid. Can I layer that, maybe put some tights on with some boots and wear that same dress, but in a much more colder climate if it's like fall or, or winter? And that's something that I would probably pack. Take things that are a necessity and not things that are going to weigh you down or you're not going to use whatsoever. Maybe like that really nice jacket that you really like but you haven't worn yet, you're probably not gonna wear it in Barcelona. So don't take it. I always like to always take one item with me that maybe won't be as like useful, if you will, in like day-to-day -day life. I always like something that will remind me of any like past trips or friends or things like that. So like there are a few photos that I like to take with me, some postcards that I have collected to like put on my wall and to just make it feel like it's more my space. And that's just like a little tip. I wouldn't say like if your grandma made you this like really lovely blanket, I'd probably recommend not taking that because it might be really bulky, but maybe there's like a sweater that you really love, you know, that you wear when you're home, when you're like self-care Sundays or something something you can take that you can make some room for that sweater research the weather see how that applies to you in the context of what you're used to and then pack going from that number five making friends community I think that's also like one of those obstacles and hurdles that come with moving abroad that people are afraid of to a certain extent you're definitely going to experience moments of being by yourself and probably feeling a little bit lonely it's just the natural process of moving abroad and we are in a, a place that you're not used to where you don't have your community. When it comes to community and making friends, like it's hard. And if you're only going to go there for maybe a year or six months, that can also be a little bit challenging. But it's also equally challenging when like you decide to stay maybe after the year or two years and building that community. So I think that if you're teaching abroad or going for an internship or studying abroad, I think really using that kind of experience to your advantage because more likely than not, there are probably going to be other teachers, if you're teaching like English, other teachers within Barcelona, maybe from the same program, from different programs, studying abroad, there are going to be other people in your program who probably also maybe move there as well to study or an internship, maybe you're part of the same organization. Lean into those experiences, at least in the very beginning. Make friends, you guys are living a shared experience together, so you have a lot in common already as like your baseline. Joining Facebook groups, there's a lot of expat communities. There are meetups, language exchanges that you can be a part of and partake in. There's also a social media, TikTok, or other great ways to find other communities and expats, not just solely on Facebook groups. So there are, I think, a lot of resources nowadays to really get to meet people and build that community. And remember that building a community is like any relationship that you have in your life. It takes time and it's the same type of mentality when you're living abroad. So definitely take advantage and lean into those people within your groups or programs or whatever it may be in the very beginning. I have great friends that I've made that way. And then expand, you know, look for other Facebook groups, look for other expat communities, other people living in the city who are down to go for a drink, for a coffee. And if you want more recommendations or more tips, so my podcast, Navigating Life Abroad, episode seven is with Flavia, a friend that I actually met through Instagram 
Instagram who lived in Barcelona, I literally asked her specifically like any tips on making friends because I know that's something that really, you know, fears people when it comes to moving abroad. And she gave some great advice and tips. So I definitely recommend listening to that episode if you want to know more about Barcelona and specifically also about making friends in Barcelona. I think that's a great resource. And just remember to lean into that feeling of, of loneliness if that ever comes up. It's part of the process and I think what makes a moving abroad experience meaningful and transformative because it's an opportunity to really get to know yourself as a person. Number six, language, learning, and culture. Probably like my favorite part of like the moving abroad because it's like for me personally this is what I love about moving abroad is getting to close to immersion as possible. I don't think you'll fully be immersed in a city or country if you don't live there for like a couple of years I think. So in Barcelona remember that they yes they speak Spanish but they also speak Catalan. Just as much as they speak Spanish, Catalan is in their everyday life. I've mentioned this I think in all of my videos, but it is because it is so important, especially if you're planning to move to Barcelona. Ingrain that in your head like they speak Catalan and so don't think that you're just going to prepare by speaking and learning Spanish. Yes, you will get by, but if you're going to go there for the culture uh, and, and that experience and try to be as respectful as possible, again something that I really wish I like would have realized and I felt like no one was really like putting it in my face that like you you really need to like know Catalan to some extent, uh, like practice it. Research a few words. I'm telling you <laughs> what I wish someone would have told me. Whether you're downloading Duolingo or you're watching a movie or you're writing a few key phrases, make sure that you're doing that when it comes to Catalan. And so on page 19 in the research section as well, there's the whole language and culture section where you can write key phrases, ways you're going to learn, what ways can you expose yourself to Spanish and also Catalan. Another thing with the Spanish is that like even if it's a Spanish, let's say you grow speaking Spanish like I did, it's still not the same Spanish that you might be used to. A good way to expose yourself to both Spanish and to Catalan, I recommend watching movies on Netflix that come from Barcelona or in terms of like the Spanish from Spain to expose yourself to the language so you're like your ears are almost getting used to what it sounds like. Listening to music is another great way. Duolingo, taking Spanish classes or Catalan classes are things that you can take as well and depending on your situation whatever works for you and however you learn best however you want to go about that is up to you but that's something especially if you're moving to Barcelona I definitely like I just want to emphasize asterisk star <laughs> underline and highlight there are also a lot of holidays in and festivals and celebrations in Barcelona like every month. I definitely recommend looking at a calendar from there or like researching or googling like festivals in Barcelona in 2023 and just kind of getting a feel for those dates. One because it'll affect your day-to-day -day life but also like they're really fun to partake in. My personal favorite is uh, San Jordi which is kind of like really cooler version of Valentine's Day like I prefer that version a lot more and it's actually in in April at the end of this month. I, I just recommend writing those things that you want to experience as well. What are like the things about uh, Barcelona that you want to try to experience, to see, to do? Um, that's also part of the experience and the part of planning and preparing to move abroad to Barcelona. I did two videos about things you should know about Barcelona and culture. The first one is 10 things you should know, which touch on a few things that I did talk about here. And I also did the cultural um, differences and similarities of Barcelona. So if you want to be really prepared and you want to kind of get an idea of my experience or other videos out there of other creators, other people living abroad in Barcelona that share their experience, watch those videos as well to get a feel. What are the things about the day-to-day -day life, about the culture that I talk about, other people talk about, and write that down, things that interest you, that you are curious about, that you want to like maybe go into a little bit more. That's what the guide is for and that's what those videos are for as well. So now you have a place to start. I know moving abroad can be very overwhelming. There's so much to, to take into consideration to do that it can very come overwhelming very quickly in terms of like the logistical parts of it and you kind of like lose sight sometimes of the experience and so I also really wanted to take that aspect and put it into the guide as well that's something I didn't actually talk about this I just really stuck to like the logistics of everything but the guide also focuses on your mindset and has like these check-ins throughout the guide which is like to mirror the process the beginning the middle and the end as well of how you're feeling about your process about your moving abroad process living this really cool experience and it's like the intention is for you to kind of be brought to the present moment and to remember that to live the experience and the process as well the goal of this is to guide to give you a base to start but also to make the process enjoyable like trying to make the visa process enjoyable i know is ridiculous but it's an attempt to you know 
If you'd like to get your Navigate Your Move Abroad guide and checklist, I will leave that link down below. There's a lot of love and a lot of care put into it. Um, and I really hope that it helps you in your move abroad to Barcelona, or if you're watching this and not moving to Barcelona, to anywhere that it is that you're moving to. And if you have any other questions about moving abroad, moving abroad to Barcelona, let me know down below. As always, thank you so much for watching, for being here, and I will see you in the next one. Ciao.